You need to just put that a little bit. So look into the camera, right? I'm Audrey. Sam. Agree. Paul. I'm a disciple of Jesus and also an educator. I'm a grandma. I love chocolate. I'm a year seven student. I love kids. I'm a little bit creative. I love God. I'm a student in high school. I love lots of things. I followed Jesus for most of my life. I love basketball and swimming. Thereby I got to meet people from lots of different church traditions and got challenged on the ones that I've been brought up with. I love people and I love to encourage people. Compassion. That's right. That's my very favourite thing. What else do I say? Who do you think? Who do you think you are? So who do you think you are? That's the big question that we are going to address over the coming celebrations as we study this book of the Bible that's known as Ephesians. Who do you think you are? I um, think we'll do something now, which was a bit similar to earlier. I want you to think of one or two words which are a description of who you are. Just one or two words. Think of that in your mind and then we're all going to say it together at the same time. Okay, just one or two words describing who you are. Okay, ready, set, go. Oh, that was... <laughs> Big loud voice. One, two, three. Okay. I didn't really hear anything other than blah, blah, blah there. Um, so hopefully in a few weeks' time, we'll be able to get some consistency uh, on that if we do it again. Um, and you'll, you'll see why as we go through this book. Uh, before I jump in, I want to firstly welcome the people who might be watching online, both people who couldn't make it here today, who are from our community, others who are checking us out. Uh, also, quite possibly, some people at Kojanup who might be um, joining in for this series with us down the track. We welcome you as well. And we at the Billabong, um, when we're at the moment um, here live, we're in October, and for the next four celebrations up until early December, we're going to be studying um, one chapter at a time um, from the letter written to the church in Ephesus. And this was written around about 62 AD, so just under 2,000 years ago. It's written by a guy named Paul, um, as I said, to the, ch the church in the city of Ephesus. And it kind of has this theme that's running through the whole letter, um, and that is the theme of our identity. If you had to pick one thing out of this letter that Paul was trying to help his readers understand, it was this. Our identity is not found in our past, our actions, our circumstances, our positions or our titles, but our identity is found in Christ and who he is and what he has done. And so three weeks ago, Mark began to look at Ephesians chapter 1, and he was saying that we are all invited in to be part of us, um, that everybody is invited into the ultimate in-group, he said, uh, and that is those whose identity is found in Christ himself, or God's people, God's children. Um, all are invited into that. Uh, and and this message um, that Mark was talking about runs all the way through the letter, in Christ. There's so much in it, and it's way too much for us to un unpack in just six sermons. And it's not like Mark and I have all the correct insights anyway. So here's what I encourage you to do. Consume this letter. Uh, it, it is spiritual food. It, is, it will nourish you and sustain you. So I encourage you to eat it up. Eat this letter up, study it, meditate on it, read it, talk about it, pray about it, sit with it, listen to it, study it, read it, read it some more, read it again, read it a 500th time if you want to, but just consume this letter. And at the, over the following celebrations, we'll try and take a closer look of some of the background as well, what Paul, the situation he was in, the situation the readers at the time were in, um, but I uh, I hope that as I speak today and, and Mark and I both kind of teach from this, that it will motivate you to go home and study more and share with others and look at it with your friends and family. Um, so can you do that for me? And we'll all do that together. Uh, let's pray and then we'll jump into chapter 2. Loving God, I thank you for the 
privilege that it is to speak to uh, my brothers and sisters in Christ today and to share with them um, something that is breathed by you, um, inspired by a Holy Spirit and written by a faithful man of Jesus um, two odd thousand years ago. Um, thank you that the Bible has been passed down through all those years and that we have it with us today to read in English that we can understand so that we can hear you speaking to us from these very words. I pray that you would open our hearts to hear from you today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So in Ephesians chapter 2, what we're going to hear is really just a beautiful explanation of the gospel, um, meaning the good news the good news of Jesus Christ. It begins like this in verse 1. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. Now, it doesn't sound much like good news, does it? The thing about good news is that you need to hear the bad news before we can appreciate what is good. You understand that? We need to know what is the, the not-so-good stuff before we understand and appreciate good news. And this is it. Once you were dead, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil. That's more bad news. We believe that the devil, Satan, Lucifer is a real spiritual being. Once an angel created to be a minister and a servant of God, he decided he wanted to be his own ruler rebelled against God, now opposing God in any way, and we call him the enemy, the deceiver, the prince of darkness, or the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Not good news. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. Following the... the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. Some of you may have heard, many of you may have heard, uh, of an, a doctrine called original sin. That sounds, what does that mean? Um, put very simply, it's a doctrine that from birth, from when we are born, from our very beginning, our nature is not great. It is, our nature is to rebel against God and to sin and not turn towards God. And, and some people, um, me included, have had a very hard time grasping, is that, can that really be the case? Um, and I'd put it to you this way, do you have to teach a child to rebel against their parents? Or do they just know how to do it pretty well? Ah, uh, my way, me, uh, no, 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 they're pretty good at rebelling. Um, we are born... With this nature, you might say, hang on, surely God wouldn't create people to be sinful from the very beginning. And that's absolutely correct. God would not and does not. The thing is that we have inherited this sinful nature from our first father, you might call him Adam. And we're going to talk a lot about being in Christ over the next four, five celebrations. But it might also be helpful to think about being in Adam. Um, that when we are born, we are born into this nature that is sin. And you might like to think of this tent as the nature which we're inside. And if I get in, I'm now in sin. I'm in Adam. That's my nature from the beginning. We were born into that. And so before being born again, as the Bible talks about, that's our nature. Paul goes on to say this. By our very nature, we were subject to not good news. God's anger, just like everyone else. And this is serious. Again, God didn't create us to be something that he could just be angry at because he needed an outlet. That's absolutely not the case. He created us to love us, not even so that we could love him. He didn't need us. He created us to love us. But we inherited Adam's nature, not to place blame on Adam. We too have embraced sin and rebellion. And here's the thing. God is very, very angry at sin. Not angry at you. And I apologize if you've grown up growing up with somebody saying, you know, God is angry at you. God is angry and has right to be angry at sin. It's destroyed his good creation. The problem is that we embrace it 
and we hold on to it. And so what happens when we embrace this? Well, we're in the firing line, unfortunately, of God's wrath, some people might say, God's anger, and that's not a pretty thing. And you might say, are you trying to scare me, Luke? Well, maybe a little, because it's serious stuff. We don't want to be in the firing line of, of God's anger because God loves us and we don't need to stay there. Thankfully, the next word is amazingly good news. I love the next first word of verse 4. But, you know when it says but or however, something's going to change. But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. Now, how does that work? Well, it's only by God's grace that you have been saved. And we'll see that again in this chapter. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as showing in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God sa- And these are two very famous verses. God saved you by his grace, by his grace when you believed. First, God's grace for us. Then we chose to accept it. It's always God who makes the first move. One person put it like this, dead people don't make decisions. God reached out to us first. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the things you have done. It's not by works. So none of us can boast about it. And this is the best news that you will ever hear. It's not by works, it's by grace. If you ever hear people talking about works and good things will get you to heaven or will save you or will turn you towards God, it's not every other religion is about the things we can do, the works we can do to be saved. Christianity is about the work God has done and his grace so that we can be saved. And this is a crucial truth for us as we consider our identity in Christ. And I say that for this reason. When we consider the question, who do you think you are? And we take a look at the Bible, especially a book like Ephesians. What's wonderful is we discover these amazing promises in it. Like, I am blessed and I am forgiven and I am appreciated and I am loved. And you find things all over the internet which are good, feel good, really true things that God says about us. But we need the correct perspective on all of those things. And to help us get the right perspective, I want to talk for a second about cats and dogs. Uh, Karen and I, um, when we got married, moved into a place in Canning Vale. And uh, we have a housemate who has a dog. Now, Jim is the dog's name. And Jim is very loyal. Or at least I I think he's trying to be loyal. Um, He's very uh, protective of the people he lives with. We'll put it that way. Jim is also very small. And he tries to make up for his smallness with his mouth. So when the postman comes to deliver the letters, Jim tries to warn us and fend off the postman with his bark. When the postman doesn't come, but Jim thinks the postman's come, Jim still tries to fend off the postman with his bark. And so it's a little bit annoying But from what I've heard, I've never owned a cat. From what I've heard, Jim's intentions are still wonderful and that makes him better than a cat. Right, dog lovers? No? Well, let's just say that. Dogs, always loyal. Cats, just think about themselves. And this is probably the worst transition I've made to a a point about the Bible, but let's just just go with it. Um, Cat theology and dog theology. Let's talk about that for a minute. Imagine an owner has two pets, a cat and a dog. The owner and the master treats his two pets uh, wonderfully, blesses them, gives them everything they need, just showers them with affection, feeds them well, all that kind of thing. The cat will say, I must be really special that my master would love me and give me all this stuff. I must be just the most amazing being in the whole wide world. 
the dog says, I must have the most amazing master in the whole world. For him to love me that much, he must be the most amazing master and owner I could ever have. Friends, we have which one? Dog theology. We have dog theology. We have the most amazing master. The blessing and everything that we have from God is not a reflection of how good and amazing we are. It's a reflection of how good and amazing our God is. And that's a perspective we really need to start with when we come to a verse like this in verse 10. For we are God's masterpiece. We are God's masterpiece. He has created, and why? He has created us anew, and here it is again, in Christ Jesus. So we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You are a masterpiece, but why? Because you are created anew in Christ. Now this is, what I'm going to do now is really the good news in a nutshell. We have this sin tent here. This was where we were born into. This is where we were stuck. This is where we were trapped in sin, in Adam, if you like. That is our nature. But God in his grace, and I really, really hope this works because I haven't tested it. God in his grace. Yes. I'm not quite sure where the door is. Uh, This through too carefully. God in his grace give, gave us Jesus. And what happens is that when we accept that grace, instead of being in sin, we all of a sudden can be in Christ. It's actually quite cozy in here. Um, and what happens is that that means when God looks at us, he doesn't see our faults and our old nature. He has created us anew to see his perfect son who he loves very, very much. And that is the gospel in a nutshell. When God sees us, he sees not our sin, which is actually the subject of his anger. No, he sees his perfect child who he loves. Us created anew in Christ Jesus. What I love, though, is that the good news doesn't finish there. So far, it's been... Uh, very much all about me and Jesus. And we talk a lot here about the billabong, that it's not just a personal, individualistic faith that we have as Christians. Paul goes on to say this, Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. Now, the Gentiles were um, were kind of despised, and, and, and um, this word uncircumcised heathens, or that saying, was really a derogatory term that the Jews used against the Gentiles. There was division between the two groups. Used to be outsiders, called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews, who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. So for centuries, there was animosity between the two groups. The Jews called them the Gentiles. They were non-Jews. There was walls between the two people groups. um, Some of you might have been to countries where two different people groups, two different races, will have physical, literal walls built where one group can't cross over to the other side of the wall. It was like that, both in a spiritual sense and a physical sense with the temple where only the Jews were allowed and only the temple of the, the court of the Gentiles were the Gentiles allowed. Paul goes on, in those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them, talking about the Gentiles. You lived in this world without God, without hope, but now you've been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, now you've been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. Good news. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. And some of you saw this um, in Acts 10 last Sunday where the Gentiles were given the Holy Spirit. It'd be like a second Pentecost, not just God's original uh, people, the Jews. But does this mean that Gentiles now become Jews? And that was a question that was being asked. Do we now have to do that you know, circumcision stuff? Because uh, if we do, well, I don't know that I really want to go there. Uh, do the Jews have to start acting like Gentiles? Because you know, they had very different lifestyles. There was, there was maybe a bit of argument about this. And Paul introduces this rev- new, completely new idea, revolutionary thought. He said, he, Jesus, 
united Jews and Gentiles into one people. When in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He tore down the physical and spiritual walls dividing the two people. He tore down the temple, which only Jews were allowed, so Gentiles were kept away. He tore down the curtain in the temple that was where God could reside and only one person one time a year could enter into the presence of God. He tore the curtain so the Holy Spirit could be released to go into the new temple, which we'll see in a minute. He did this by ending the system of the law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross and our hostility towards each other was put to death, reconciled to God and reconciled to each other. This is a we thing. We are all in this together. And that is good news. It's a new community that we are invited to. Who do you think you are is the question. Are you someone living with the sinful inheritance of Adam, living for yourself? Or are you in Jesus? Because if you are, you are no longer just you. You are one of us. The church, the we, the body the new dwelling place of God himself, whom all are invited into. And I don't think we'd all fit in there, but the thing is that together we make the tent, the temple, the dwelling place of God, as we read now. He brought the good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away. We were Gentiles. We didn't know God, who were far away from him, and peace to the Jews who were near. And now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit, because of what Christ has done for us. Good news. So you Gentiles are now no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. We have a rich history. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, and I love this, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. The temple was torn down so that now we, not you, individual, we together, those who are in Christ, form the new dwelling place, the holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. And this is good news that God has come to dwell with us. He is creating this new temple which is made up of a building block masterpiece individual on top of another building block masterpiece individual together making the we created a new in christ and all together we make this grand design the body of christ the new temple and so it's vitally important firstly that we know our, our identity as individuals amen our identity as individuals so that we also know that we are not just individuals but part of the whole body. So let me remind you of this verse from earlier. Ephesians 2, verse 10. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. That means our identity is in Christ, and therefore we are a masterpiece. So we can do the good things he has planned for us long ago. The problem is that when I get up in the morning and I look in the mirror, I don't see a masterpiece. The problem is that when I get up in the morning and I look myself in the mirror and, and look at who I am, I don't see what God has said I'm supposed to be. I know who I am. Maybe I could say I'm a, I'm, if I want to be a masterpiece, maybe a Picasso, a bit kind of skewed and bent and not right I know who I am I know I'm not a masterpiece but I want to be one I want to be who God's created me to be everything that God's made me to be I want to live out my identity in Christ so I go to him and I say God 
do whatever it takes to get these things out of my life that I don't want to be there. Mold me more into the image of your son so that I can be your masterpiece. Whoa. Who are you? I'm God. (laughs) No, you're not. Yeah, I am. You said the prayer, so here I am. That's how it works. Uh, okay. okay. If you're God, make it rain in here. Mm, if I made it rain in here, it'd get kind of yucky, and I really don't want to do that. See, you're not God. Why do you say that? God wouldn't say yucky. Yes, I do. It's a Greek word. Oh. Well, if you're God, what does Lamentations 15.9 say? Lamentations is a really short book. There's only five chapters. Why is it so short? Oh, I got tired of lamenting. Oh. Well, if you're God, who's going to win the grand final this year, of that, next year for the AFL? You know what? I'm not so much into playing games. Why are you so much into playing games? You are God. What gave it away? You answered my question with a question. I did? <laughs> uh, yeah, I do that, don't I? <laughs> did it again. Did it, did it again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, step right up. Oh, hey, what's all this about? Oh, these are the tools that I'm going to use to make you into my original masterpiece. Cool. Oh, hang on. I thought you were a carpenter. Uh, no, that's, that's my son. All right. Step right up. Here we go. Whoa, 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 How do you know what to chisel and what to leave? Well, I take all the things in your life that aren't of me. Kind of like dead weight. Speaking of which, can you just chisel right around here? Like I, I gained it a couple of years ago, and I've been trying to get rid of it. I've been trying to exercise. It's just not working. So if you could just chisel right around this midsection, that'd be good. All right. Are you going to talk, or can I chisel? You know, which is going to be talk, chisel. Talk, chisel. No, no, no. Chisel, chisel. Yeah. Okay. Most of my children like to talk. Not me. I bring on the chisel. Okay. Here we go. Through my Holy Spirit, I'm going to bring up things that I want you to work on, like your anger. I created you, like, I created that emotion, but you use it in the wrong way. You compare yourself to others instead of me. You tell little white lies you want a people please you're lazy you have a problem with lust hang on a second I do not have a problem with lust you don't have a problem with lust no I can do lust anytime I want (sighs) fine whatever maybe we can just take a little time out I mean we're you know I've been doing pretty well don't you think looking pretty good you are doing pretty good but when you look at yourself in the mirror Who do you see? I see me. (laughs) Okay, then I need to keep chiseling because ultimately you and others need to see my son. Here we go. Uh, uh, Hold on. Don't take this the wrong way. But the thing is that when I start to look more like your son, other people kind of don't like it and they get uncomfortable around me. Even my friends at church, they're like, well, you're holier than thou when you're... So what you're doing right now is that you'd rather play God in certain areas of your life rather than for me to be God over all of your life. I did not say that. That's what you meant. Yes, it is. It's hard to talk to you. You know everything that I'm thinking. I'm just saying, you know, you've done some good work. Maybe we take a little break, a little time out. We'll come back to it. What you're doing right now is common. It's called controlling. Do you want me to control the things in your life or can I chisel? Control, chisel, no, no, no. control, chisel. Chisel, chisel. But can we chisel where I want to chisel? That's called control. Oh. Fine. You've been holding on to this for a long time. You ready for this? Yeah. Ah, it hurts. It hurts me more than it hurts you. Right. I don't think you understand this pain, God. Pardon me? You're asking me to sacrifice a lot. Luke, trust me. I know all about sacrifice. I sent my son to die on the cross for sin and for pain. But I also did it for another reason. To give you freedom. Do you know what insanity is? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting to get a different result. And there are things in your life that you've been doing for a long time, for years. These empty wells that don't have anything to offer. Allow me to chisel them out of your life. 
allow me to produce my character in you where you keep focusing so much on your image. I'm thinking that maybe we're your thoughts are not my thoughts. Okay, but if we went another way, your ways are I, not my look, ways. Look, I can't be good. You can't be good. I've made you good. Be good. What? <laughs> Nothing you wouldn't understand. I, God of all the universe, wouldn't understand something that one of my children has to say. Try me. It's just God, I've let you down so much. You were never holding me up. I hold you up with my victorious, righteous right hand. Don't you forget that. In this relationship, I hold you up. Okay, chisel away. Just be prepared for what you're going to find in there. Because I know who's inside and I wake up every morning and stare in the mirror and look at this little kid who's trying to act and dress like an adult. But I can't. So just be prepared for what you're going to find in there. You've listened for too many, for too long to too many voices that aren't of me. You think you're junk, don't you? You really think you're junk. Listen to me. I don't make junk. What would that say about me? How can I show you that my love for you has no boundaries? Reach into your back pocket. What? Reach into your back pocket. Why? Are you arguing with me? Reach into your back pocket. God. Yes. I was just saying, God, I'll do that right now. You were just saying my name in vain. It's a name. It's a saying. It's more than a name. It's more than a saying. It's more than a bad habit. It's the name above all names. And I want to teach you something about my name. Okay. What's that? It's a page from my journal a little while ago. How'd you get this? Hello. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Go ahead, read it. I love Karen. No, no, the other side. The other side. Sorry. I married her. Yeah, I was there. Oh. 5th of December 2010 Dear God I want to know you I want to turn completely from my sin I give my life to you Please lead me by your spirit to do your will and use my time to worship you in everything Teach me how to be a disciple of Christ You have my heart God Please change it Whatever it takes. I love you, God. I love you too, Luke. I love you too much to leave you where you're at. So this salvation that you hold, don't let it become some sentimental gush or some head knowledge. I want you to work it out in every detail of your life. And don't compare yourself to someone else because that's just trivial nonsense. You are my original masterpiece. You're one of my workmanship, and in you I find favour. This? Don't look at this as a prison, but look at it as a father disciplining his child. The father disciplines the ones he loves. I know, but it's going to be tough. Yes, it will be tough. But you've bought into the lie thinking that everything would be easy when you said yes to me. That's not how it works. I want you to do something. I want you to look out to all these people and I want you to say, Luke is God's original masterpiece. Luke is... No, 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 no. Not the way you see yourself or the way the other, you fear others will see you, but how I see you. Luke is God's original masterpiece. Yes, you are. So are you. God does not make junk. You are an original masterpiece. And together, God is making us into the new temple in which he lives. It will take some chiseling, no doubt about it. Because we struggle with an old self that was born into sin and rebellion against God. But the good news is when that when we accept his grace shown to us, that old dead person is gone. The word says he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the things he planned for us long ago. 
an original masterpiece. My child, you may not know me, but I know everything about you. I know when you sit down and when you rise up. I am familiar with all your ways. Even the very hairs on your head are numbered. For you were made in my image. In me, you live and move and have your being. I knew you before you were conceived. I chose you when I planned creation. You were not a mistake, for all your days are written in my book. I determined the exact time of your birth and where you would live. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I knit you together in your mother's womb and brought you forth on the day you were born. Every good gift that you receive comes from my hand, for I am your provider and I meet all your needs. My plan is for your future and has always been filled with hope. Because I love you with an everlasting love, my thoughts towards you are countless as the sand on the seashore, and I rejoice over you with singing. I desire to establish you with all my heart and all my soul. And I want to show you great and marvellous things. If you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. I am your Father and I love you, even as I love my Son Jesus. For in Jesus, my love for you is revealed. He is the exact representation of my being. He came to demonstrate that I am for you not against you. And I tell you that I am not counting your sins. Jesus died so that you and I could be reconciled. His death was the ultimate expression of my love for you. And if you receive the gift of my son Jesus, you receive me. And nothing will ever separate you from my love again. Come home and I'll throw in the biggest party heaven has ever seen. I have always been father and I always will be father. My question is, will you be my child? I am waiting for you.